Eskimo gets here, everybody's gonna jump for joy. It is NH Unscripted. I am your Eskimo-like host, Ray Dudley. And we are coming to you from the not overly ostentatious digs of the WKXL Studios in Concord. 1450 AM, 103.9 FM. And for you Manchesterites, 101.9 FM on the dial. And our URL is nhtalkradio.com. A little bit more about that later. I need to thank my sponsor. That would be Lakes Region Fence in Guilford. Depending on when you hear this show, Valentine's Day is coming up. Nothing says love like a new picket fence. Yes, sir. Head on out to LRFence.com, LRFence.com, and make your partner as happy as can be. Who needs chocolates? Who needs arrows dipped in love? Head out there. You'll see a lot of beautiful work done by Lakes Region Fence. They actually really do honestly do some of the finest work I've ever seen in fences. I mean, you know, if you're into fences... We are. Who isn't? Uh, head on out to LRFence.com. Matt, we thank you and your crew for sponsoring NH Unscripted. And now in the house with me for a repeat visit is an A-lister, our A-lister, Jim Rosenberg from Shaheen and Gordon. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you again. Thank you for having me back. Do you think so? I called you an A-lister, and so for our A-listers... We always have something that we that This we is broke unbelievable. The Gifts huh? again. What? Are you kidding? And when I walked in, I Look told it. you, because last time I was here, I'm sure you can't forget that you were kind enough to give me a moxie. It's like being at the movies. And delighted to see that I actually opened it and consumed it. And look at these fantastic huh? gifts. We've got the oldies but goodies of Charleston True, Raisinets, Milk Duds, and Peanut M&Ms, all color coordinated in yellow boxes. Speaking of Valentine's Day, you feel the love, Amazing, brother? but you... I have I do feel the love, but I I regret to say I've got nothing to give you in return. Like many a marriage, I promised you I would come back bearing <laughs> gifts, and I failed you again. But it was because it was because as I disclosed to you when I walked in, I had a wild night out last night. Oh my god! And I was just rolling in from Portsmouth this morning, where I stayed over to save myself. Oh, thank the you. The embarrassment, the legal trauma, and the punishment of a potential impaired driving charge, which I hope we can talk about a lot today as oh. I defend those cases. What a and segue. I'd love to tell you about DUI defense and the life type of work I do. Okay. But I made a wise and responsible decision to stay in Portsmouth last night, as I was out with some dear friends, a high school friend of mine named James Parkington. Oh, you're going to throw them under the bus? Just are you? a wonderful guy, a okay. dear friend of mine, and any chance I get to catch up with him is a chance worth taking. Another dear friend named Pat Lyons. So we went out because Pat um, uh, saw or got a recommendation to go to a, a music show for a band called Cosmic Country. Hmm. And they were playing at the 3S Art Space. I'm not sure oh, I'm calling that. I love right. that Do you place. know what I'm talking about? I do, I do. The Portsmouth Film Festival, uh, that's one of their venues. Oh, no kidding. And yep. do they use their little concert venue space with a bar in back in order to do that show? No. Okay. They've got a little art space, too, like an art gallery adjacent yeah. to a music venue, which I thought was an excellent place to watch. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. No, yeah. they just had a little, like, raised area where they, the film producer would talk about their film and all that stuff. So. Really cool. I mean, it's amazing to see the growth of that small city since I was a you kid. You not kidding. Including where I stayed, I stayed at the AC Hotel, which is right next door Dude, you're to plugs left and right to here. the three S art space. <laughs> but we ate at Barrio. Have you eaten there? I have not. Well, I think you should. What type of food? Um, tacos, and it's Ooh. kind of uh, design your own taco, soft shell, hard shell. Yeah. And I'll tell you, the food I thought was top notch. Um, we went out uh, before that. We went first to a place called Earth Eagle, a little brewery that happened, luckily happened to have an open mic night. So that was a, we had two music venues and a bonus and good luck. So we went out to Earth Eagle, really good beers, and they've got a. Are you going to tell me about open mic? Did you do anything at open mic oh, man, that you if, can remember? If I could <laughs> sing, you, my family, and all my friends would already know about it. I would be singing from the rooftops, but I have no, none, I thought no that was the purpose of open mic. 
No, with all the it folks, was, the little ones who can't sing. It's for me to absorb and, and all the wonderful talent in the room, but not to participate myself. I saved that for you and for your radio show. Oh, thanks. You're going to sing now? <laughs> yeah, no, no. That <laughs> Your one listener would definitely turn off the radio <laughs> at that point, I think. But it was a great time. And then um, uh, we ended up um, uh, seeing the music. And I tell you, it was this intense, long endurance type of country jam band music that this is cosmic uh, what cosmic country okay. i know nothing about them like i said my friend pat Lyons, a lovely soul from portsmouth um got a recommendation and then sent a shout out to a couple of our friends and i happened to say i do and so we went out there and had a good night but wow. because of my um intense midweek social calendar mm-hmm. i failed to do <laughs> what i me. intended which yeah. is bring you a gift to reciprocate appropriately for the generosity you've shown to me. Not needed, my friend. I've failed you, man. <laughs> I've totally Not failed needed. you. But I, I mean, I'm delighted. Wait till the to be guys back. at the beef hear about this. Oh, the guys at the beef. So <laughs> we played the. You you had me on recently. Mm-hmm. We had a delightful time, as I I told you the story of Bob Proventure's tragic. Homicide yes, and murder. Peckerville, by the way. And The Forgotten Neighborhood of Concord, which yes. is Peckerville. Yes. But both true stories. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm so pleased to have had a chance to share them with you. Yep. Yeah. And so the Monday after I was on, you, you, the show aired, I think, that Friday. Is it, that right? Yeah, that's right. And the Monday after I was on, I played my usual simulator golf league night up with the group, the great group at Beaver Meadow. Yep. And my, uh, uh, my amazing team, uh, Kirk, Cormick, and Shane, we go out to slay it in the simulator golf league every Monday night. And your dear son, Caleb, yes. was kind to turn it up and put it on the speaker for us. So as all were golfing in the simulator league, they listened to you and me. Talk about that homicide case. They might have been the only people to listen. There's nothing at least like did a, listen. a chilling evening at the Beef with that playing in the background. Man, they do a, they do a good job up there. And Caleb's food. Did I tell? Did you know it was on the special menu this past Monday? I did not. So he invented something called the jalapeno popper double cheeseburger. Oh, that kid, man. Oh, and he should get a Nobel Peace Prize for this. He needs to bring that home. Is have you 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 haven't no had an he hasn't made it no no we do so a lot of cooking. It's buddy. really interesting because Beaver Meadow Golf Club is a year round place. I think people think of it only as a place, the oldest municipal golf course in the state, a wonderful track that they've approved upon year after year. Yeah. Um, Phil and Josh and the spirit animal of golf, Charlie Lapore, do an amazing job hosting our community to play golf. But they operate year round, and there's free cross cross country skiing when there's snow enough to do it of course yeah and then you can use the clubhouse as your warming hut and as you know at the 19th hole the group at aces does a great job they do. nourishing our whole community in- including your great son <laughs> and and he i think uses this time i already of year. gave you candy you don't have to keep pushing <laughs> well it's the you, your family clearly is into the you know culinary arts we right? are we are indeed um it, i think he uses the winter simulator league they have a simulator league where We've got pretty high tech simulators up there. Yeah, they're and, really nice. And it's a great way for us northern golfers. I'm a terrible, terrible golfer, as anyone up there will tell you, but a great way for the northern golfers to keep their swings loose and have a laugh doing it, playing in the simulator league up there. And I think Caleb uses the off season to get creative in the kitchen. Wouldn't surprise me because business is for him slower. And so he does have the time to experiment. That's my sense, is that he's yeah, experimenting. He's smart. No doubt. And then rolls out what might work for the masses when the crowds pick up and the snow melts in the spring with golf and stuff like that. Yep. But And I don't know this because he hasn't said this to me, but I I, uh, am a weekly guinea pig. I always go up there and eat dinner. I show up an hour early. I ask him what to get. He usually tells me what he's feeling good about. Yeah. And it's some concoction. This time I know. Of year. I know. I know. He's always tinkering. Yeah. I it's, love it when he cooks at home for us. Yeah. Um, you know, we good. fire up the smoker at home and he just takes off. He's he's like, we should try this flavor and this flavor and this flavor. And so many of them I have never heard of. And, and but they turn out great. He's got a knack for it. So. Well, there's a, a, a real creative expression in that, right? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, there's an intensity of it in the environment he's in where he's got to produce quickly, yeah. deal with volume. A lot of pub food. Be consistent. Do all those things critical if you're you know, on the retail end of the yeah. food industry. But there's a real craft to it you know, and a real creativity to it. Yeah. And it, it's an art in and of itself. Totally. So. Totally. 
All right. Totally. That's wonderful. So you didn't get a DUI. No, I didn't because I made the right decision to and stay put. And what would put, that be? Which is I got a hotel room at the AC Hotel Ooh. right next to the Barrio. Great hotel there, too. One of many new ones in Portsmouth. But I'd be happy to talk to you about my work defending DUI cases if that's something you want to do. Yeah, I would like to spend a few minutes on that. Ooh, we're putting a plug in it right there for okay. a second. We'll pick up when we left oh, off. Oh, it's time for Raisinette, baby! You are listening to NH Unscripted. I am your soon-to-be happier host, Ray Dudley. We are coming to you from the YMCA-like digs of the WKXL Studios in Concord. 1450 AM, 103.9 FM, and 101.9 FM in Manchester. NH Talk Radio is the URL. Jim Rosenberg's in the house, and I have some questions about DUI stuff that I've seen on YouTube. Let me tear it down. Coming up in a little while, I may be right, I may be wrong, but I'm perfectly willing to swear this is NH Unscripted. I am your sugar overdosing host, Ray Dudley. We are coming to you from the water country like digs of the WKXL studios deep, deep, deep in the heart of Concord. 1450 AM, 103.9 FM, 101.9 FM in Manchester. NHTalkRadio.com is the URL. I'll explain a little bit more about what's out there in a minute. Jim Rosenberg from Shaheen and Gordon happens to be in the house, and I have some questions for him about DUI stuff. Don't ask me why. It just happens to be on my mind. Anyway, Jim. I have seen things on YouTube like, you know, if you get stopped for a DUI, you have a little card that's on you, you roll down your window a quarter of an inch, you slide it out, and it says something like, I don't have to talk to you, my mother doesn't have to talk to you, my dog doesn't have to talk to you, I, I have a lawyer that could come by, something like that. What? What is true? What can you get up, not get away with? Well, but, you can but, do that. I yeah. but I've heard this trick too, where people say just roll down the window, uh, you know, and not to put your license through, yeah, and don't yeah. interact in any meaningful way with the officer. I think that's a terrible approach. I think that police officers are people too, and if you are dealing with anyone in your profession and in, in your personal life and wherever it might be, you'd wish to be treated with the same respect that you would naturally and normally give. To anyone, wouldn't it? Doesn't it seem to set up something like very adversarial from the beginning? Totally, totally confrontational from the beginning, and an immediate reason for that officer to suspect that something is um, of a concern. If you're only rolling down the window a little bit, that I would think is suspicion that you don't want to have that person detect. Uh, the odor of your breath or get a good look at your eyes to see if they're watery and bloodshot or droopy or yeah. if your face is flushed. Those common um, clues for potential impairment that these police officers are trained to look for during their initial encounter with a potential vehicle. And so I always think that that's getting off on the wrong foot. In fact, the cases that are the hardest ones for me as a criminal defense lawyer in our community to solve are those cases that stick in the craw of the police officer or in turn the prosecutor because of my client because their potential suspect is difficult, disagreeable, cantankerous, over-emotional, um, uh, you know, just upset and freaking out, or uncooperative. Those are the cases that are difficult to resolve because those are the cases that the police officers remember. When people are kind and cooperative and polite, it goes better for them in real time. And sober. And, and sober. Well, and that's I'm the most kidding. important priority, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the answer here, no matter what I do or how I earn money doing it, is don't drink and drive. Yeah. I mean, if you want to save yourself from trouble, don't put yourself in the position where a police officer is inquiring about whether or not you are impaired and whether you are fit to drive. But the truth of the matter is it's the one area of the law where, where average citizens who are parents and people and function at work and in their communities get criminal defense lawyers because though they're not criminals themselves, it's the one time where average members of our community face the defense of a criminal of, uh, a charge. Because
because DUI is a criminal charge. Even a standard first offense DUI in New Hampshire is a Class B misdemeanor, and a Class B misdemeanor is a crime. Now, if you're convicted of that crime, Class B misdemeanor DUI, that's a standard garden variety first offense. One year from the conviction date, we can help you file a motion, and that motion will ask that the court reduce the criminal charge, the misdemeanor charge, down to a violation. The DUI statute in New Hampshire for a true first offense will allow you to reduce that after a year to a non-criminal violation. That step, however, does not erase or annul or expunge the conviction altogether. It just recategorizes it. It moves it from a criminal conviction over to a non-criminal violation, but it still remains for 10 years thereafter. 10 10 years. years. In New Hampshire, the DUI, quote, look back is 10 years long. So if you get a DUI. Bankruptcy is only seven. Right. I know. This one really sticks, doesn't it? And the reason they do that is uh, there's several reasons. But if you were ever to, again, be charged with or convicted of a DUI, they want to be able to apply more significant punishments and penalties the next time around, including a brief jail term, longer license loss, requirement to install an ignition interlock, higher fine, all those things come with a subsequent offense, and there'd be no way for them to get to that subsequent offense unless they memorialize the first DUI conviction on your record. So we've got a 10-year look back where they look back 10 years to see if there was a prior offense in order to enhance the punishment and penalties the second time around. And it happens all the time because uh, police these days have onboard uh, terminals where they can run a license plate, and if the owner of the car has a DUI on the record, they see it in real time, and I strongly suspect that likely causes them to pull over the it car in front of so them quicker. It seems so punitive. I don't mean the initial one, but the, the the fact that it sits there for 10 years and they can just, like they're waiting for you to do something wrong. 10 years is a long time. Well, punitive in one way, no doubt, but the risks and dangers of impaired driving on the road yeah. are likely significant, likewise significant, and punitive to victims of all sorts of drunk driving Mm -hmm. accidents. And so memorializing that's important so that they can apply harsher penalties as for a second offense. Um, But there's other reasons, too. If you were to collect minor and major motor vehicle convictions, the state eventually can certify you as a habitual offender. So let's say you got three major motor vehicle driving violations in a span of five years, or two majors or four minors or one major and eight minors, and any combination of those, the Department of Safety and Concord and Hazen Drive can hold a hearing to decide whether they're going to certify you as a habitual offender. And if you've accumulated that many motor vehicle convictions of that type, then they'll take your privilege to drive for between one to four years. And that can be in addition to any other license losses you've got on the underlying conviction. So they want to be able to look at those offenses if you're a really horrible driver and a dangerous driver in order to apply more significant collateral downstream consequences at the Department of Safety. And so they don't want to lose sight of them. Same for points. We've got a point system. Your average over 21 person is allowed to accumulate 12 points in a calendar year. A DUI conviction is six. Your average speed in case is three. A high speed case is four. So you got to kind of work at it to get to 12 points, but that's another reason why Mm -hmm. they don't want you just to be able to erase your motor vehicle record. They want to track a bad and dangerous driver. They certainly want to track someone um, who's got a record of impaired driving. Massachusetts, our sister state to the south, has a lifetime look back. What? So if you think that 10 years is a long time, I do. Um, there, uh, you can't um, cleanse your record of an impaired driving conviction because it's ever? a lifetime look back. Yeah, ever. That's ever. insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. your average DUI occurs just with someone driving down the road. There's yeah. like 22 different clues for potential impairment that our police officers are trained to look for. And they're the things, Ray, you'd expect to see. People um, weaving in their lane, taking wide turns, having erratic changes in speed, failing to recognize or respect signals and signs. Those things not only might be motor vehicle violations, some are, some aren't, but they're also taught to our officers to be potential clues for impairment. So a good officer will will take note of those concerns during the operational phase of a DUI investigation. And then based on a motor vehicle violation like speeding or a yellow line or who knows what, they initiate a stop. 
And once you start the stopping sequence, police are also trained that there's a number of clues that they're to look for, too. If the officer turned on the lights and the driver of the car in front of them startles and jerks to the right, that's a clue they're taught is also a clue for a potential impairment. If the driver takes too long to stop or doesn't stop at all or abruptly stops and hits a curb or another object, um, all those things are clues trained to our officers to be potentially consistent with impairment. So as I'm looking at police reports, I'm also looking to see if officers noted those clues. And if they don't, I'll always say, officer, once you turn on your lights and decide to stop this car, they stopped right away. They respected your signal to do so. They didn't jerk hard to the right. They didn't take too long to stop. They stopped comfortably without running into anything. And in that way, all the clues, officer, for impairment you're trained to look for weren't actually present when Johnny was pulled over, right? And that's evidence. That's evidence just like yeah. your performance on field tests might be, your performance on a breath their blood test might be. And then when the officer approaches the car, they start to look for or train to look for the things you and I were just mentioning. Um, glassy bloodshot eyes, slow, slurred, and deliberate speech, a distinct odor of alcohol. None of those things in and of themselves are proof positive impairment, but they're all clues police are trained to look for and ones they know too. And again, as a defense lawyer, when they're not there, I'll point them out. You had a conversation about where he was coming and going. He um, was able to describe to you with a pretty sharp tongue that he was coming from Londonderry to go home and it was after work. And you didn't note in that conversation or in your report that his speech was slow or slurred or deliberate, right? And that's something, officer, you're trained to look for, but something also not present during your interaction with this particular client. Um, and then they always ask for license and registration, right? right, and right. We've all had that experience where oh, an officer right. pulls you over and your heart starts pounding a little bit and they ask for your license and registration. And obviously, we'll pick that up too when we're back. This is incredible. I'm like living in a time warp. Hey, get that? Evil Dead guy, Time War. Anyway, that was a Rocky Horror. You are... Okay, so I have a question for you that's going to be coming up. What is the connection between DUIs and aliens? Answer, Jim Rosenberg. We're coming back. You're listening to NH Unscripted. I am your happy-to-be-out-of-bed host, Ray Dudley. We are coming to you from the Taj Mahal-like digs of the WKXL studios, and we're going to be right back. 1450 AM, 103.9 FM, 101.9 FM in Manchester, nhtalkradio.com is the URL. We'll be back. Don't you know me? I'm your native son. Woo! This is NH Unscripted. I am your Arlo Guthrie-like host, Ray Dudley. We are coming to you from the water country kind of digs over here at the WKXL Studios in Concord. 1450, that's on the AM dial, 103.9 on the FM dial. And for you folks who we love so much in Manchester, 101.9 FM. Our URL where you can find the archives of this great show, all of the other sh programs here at the WKXL Studios, as well as there's a Listen Live button out there, nhtalkradio.com. We're proud of that. We are talking DUIs and aliens. Jim, do you want to finish on DUIs first? Well, all right, let's start with that. Uh, I'll just make the this. I'm making a corporate executive decision. We're sticking with DUIs temporarily. What is the appropriate actions that you should be taking as a driver should you be pulled over? Well, it depends on the circumstances. So first of all, being cooperative and polite. But that doesn't mean you're obligated to acknowledge or to admit anything. You've got rights, and that includes a right not to answer, to remain silent. And if you're ever talking to law enforcement about a criminal event, and that includes potentially a DUI or certainly something more serious, I recommend you talk to a lawyer who's experienced in both the locality where they work but also defending criminal cases so that they can advise you and potentially take up on your behalf 
any communications between you and law enforcement. So you've got constitutional rights, they're real, but we also live in the real world. And there's some practical realities that apply to any communications with law enforcement and being kind and polite, I think, is first and foremost true. But if Would you ever advise somebody to say to them, I plead the fifth. I'm not going to, I don't have to implicate myself. Plead the fifth sounds a little formalistic, oh, but, I know. but absolutely. That's what we um, do here. Um, those things you say really can get used against you, and no doubt in DUI cases, breath and blood tests give to police and prosecutors a scientific test that if it's over an 08, which is the per se value for impairment in New Hampshire, it's a line in the sand our lawmakers drew for us, where if you exceed it, you're presumed to be impaired to some degree. Those are harder cases, and so supplying that. That type of evidence is really important to a state's case and very convincing and harder for me as a defense lawyer. But so, too, are those things you say to officers. Those things you say really can get used against you. It's not just something you hear about on shows like yours. And so if you were to be pulled over and say, you got me. I'm blotto. I had six at the bar, which usually means eight or ten. Um, that type of evidence is no doubt as convincing, in my view, as a test, because those things you say, especially under our rules of evidence, are considered to be reliable. Why would you make a statement against your own interest mm. unless it's a more truthful statement? And so there's there's a, a, a power or a priority placed on those things that the accused, that a defendant says. Those things are admissible in court. Normally in court. Those things you say outside of the courtroom aren't automatically admissible. They're considered hearsay. Um, statements made outside of court that are intended in court to prove the truth of what you said in the statement. That's hearsay in the general rule. That's not allowed. But there's an enormous exception, and one exception is for those things the bad guy might say, the defendant, the accused party, the party opponent. Those things uttered by that person are considered reliable, and therefore the rules of evidence allow them to be admitted in, in criminal cases. There's no more powerful piece of evidence than someone saying they did it even in, I think, eyewitness testimony. So those things say you say can be used. So you should take care um, uh, to exercise rights not to speak when asked, but also in considering what to do. My favorite cases are ones where someone does well on field tests. There's three standard field tests. This funny eye test, which is called the horizontal gaze nystagmus test, and that's where they hold a pen of their finger 12 to 15 inches from the bridge of your nose. They do slow sweeps back or forth, looking for three clues in each eye, six clues in all. And really what they're trying to evaluate is as you follow the pen of their finger, they watch your eye. And if your eye involuntarily jerks or shakes, which is kind of like a windshield riper stuttering on a dry windshield, that phenomenon is called a nystagmus. And a nystagmus can be a potential clue for impairment, either by drugs or alcohol. But there's natural things that can cause a nystagmus as well. Someone with a brain tumor, tragically, or history of concussions, or common eye conditions, for instance, an astigmatism is said to cause a natural nystagmus. So mm. there are things quite apart from impairment from drugs or alcohol that can cause that particular condition. So what New Hampshire courts have said is they'll allow police officers and prosecutors to admit that evidence from that funny eye test, the HGN test, but they won't allow the state to rely only on that test to prove someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay. Law enforcement has to include or blend that evidence along with other evidence, those things you say, your performance in the other tests, in order to support a guilty verdict in court. And the other tests are a nine-step walk-and-turn test where they're looking for eight clues and they're funny. It's like they have you stand there in a heel-to-toe instructional position in your arms at your side. And as you stand there, they explain how to do the test to you. And they say, don't start until I tell you to start. Well, if you step out of that instructional position to get comfortable, kind of standing at ease, if you will, that's considered the first of eight clues. If you start to test what? too soon. Yes, if you start to test too soon before they tell you to start. That's a clue. And that's a little bit of a game. So I've seen officers who give the instructions really fast about how to do the nine-step walk and turn. And during the instructions, they'll say, don't start until I tell you to start. And then they'll suddenly stop. And in that pregnant pause, of course, the person starts the test. Entrapment. And, I'm calling entrapment right there. And I think you're right, Ray. That should be a lawyer. Yes, you should be. You've got natural instincts, <laughs> sharp ones, too. Man. <laughs> we got to get out of this basement studio and get you in a courtroom. Yeah, or to Portsmouth in a bar. Exactly. <laughs> I suspect you would flourish in either environment. Good point. Very good point. <laughs> I think I have. <laughs> so in any event, they'll kind of game you into that first clue. Don't 
don't start till I tell you to start, but then they pause and don't tell you to start, and the person naturally goes, and there's a clue, and then whether it's you count correctly nine steps out or nine steps back without using your arms for balance more than six inches from your side, without stopping in the middle of the stat test, having a gap between more than a half an inch between your heel to your toe, screwing up this funny shuffle turn Wait, did they you tell say you to do. Wait, half an inch? Yes. Okay, I need to ask you, because I have heard this, that 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 test is um, not, I'm going to not say geared towards failure, but it involves a lot of ways that you would not normally walk or or totally move. The shuffle turn's a great example of it. So you're supposed to plant one foot and do a series of small shuffle steps in order to turn around. No one, no one turns around that way in their normal life. Right. And I've defended like military guys who get stopped and they served 20 years ago. And so there was specific training that's like rooted in their muscle memory about how to do an about face. They do it that way perfectly, but still are marked as a clue because technically they didn't follow the instructions, which by the way, you're getting in New Hampshire under adverse weather conditions. Conditions, often at odd hours on the side of the road with cars whizzing by, a stressful circumstances for people who aren't criminals. I'm stressed by right now. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> we got to eat some of this candy. It'll you, take the edge off. I'm telling you, you're an you're an a a lister here. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'm just fortunate <laughs> to be here with the real a listers here. So what what would you suggest? What is okay? Uh, uh, you get stopped. You get pulled over. You do pull over. What happens at that point? Well, if you're able, to, if you're physically you fit to do those tests, I like it when people do do them because it gives me a lot of questions to ask. And I describe the type I would. Like on the nine-step walk and turn, the classic clue for impairment is whether you counted correctly, nine out, nine back. And if there was no complaint from the officer in the report about that, I'll say, officer, a classic clue for impairment is whether or not the person counted correctly, nine out, nine back, right? Well, in this particular case, you didn't complain at all about Susie missing the count. And that means that she counted correctly, nine out, she counted correctly correctly nine back that's 18 steps in all and she counted all 18 of those steps perfectly didn't she officer and in that way that classic clue for impairment you're trained to look for officer just wasn't present here when Susie did the test and so by doing the test if you're fit enough to do them it gives me an awful lot to ask about now those tests though discriminate they discriminate based on age and weight and injury and calamity you could have an 18 year old kid totally blotto but really fit who could stand on one foot all night long Mm. But me, just a little bit larger than he might wish to be, who'd struggle with that test due to natural wear and tear of life without concern for impairment at all. And so they're not always fair. But my favorite case is one where someone does well on blood on field testing, but then declines to do breath of blood testing. Okay. Because is that, do you suggest it? I shouldn't. I don't even know. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it's not putting me on the spot at all. I get this question all the time. Do, should you or should you not turn it down? So it depends on circumstances. If you refuse the test, you're going to get a six-month administrative license suspension. We can file a request just for, turning it down. Just for refusing breath or blood testing. They're going to take your New Hampshire privilege to drive then and there, give you a pink form instead. That pink form behaves as a temporary privilege to drive, and temporary means it's only good for 30 days. After that 30 days, in a first offense anyway, a six-month suspension of your privilege to drive snaps into place against you. We'd ask for a hearing to contest it, but that's not a trial in a courtroom with a judge in a robe applying a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. That's a state paid hearing examiner at New Hampshire's Department of Safety holding that hearing. Oh my God, put a pin in it. I'm riveted. I am riveted. I may be right, I may be wrong, but I'm perfectly willing to swear you have found NH unscripted. I am happy to be in the house with Jim Rosenberg of Shane and Gordon. 1450 AM, 103.9 FM, and 101.9 FM in Manchester. NH Talk Radio is the URL. We got some milk duds to down over here. We will be back about aliens. You were listening to NH Unscripted. I am your turning cartwheels kind of host, Ray Dudley. You were listening to us either 
on the AM Band at 1450 or 103.9 FM in Concord or perhaps you're in Manchester, 101.9 FM or perhaps you're kind of a computer geek and you need a URL. You may be listening to us at nhtalkradio.com. I'm wasting time. I need to hear about this DUI stuff and then we got to get into aliens. Yeah. Oh, we, we can do it. both. We All can right. do both. That's why I'm Take here. Take it away. Totally. So we were asking about whether you should or shouldn't decline the invitation to do breath of blood testing. Yes. And I explained before the break that by refusing to do it, they're going to take your license, give you a six-month administrative suspension and privilege to drive. But the k- kicker is if you take the test and blow over an 08 or have a breath result exceeding a blood alcohol content of 0.08, they're also going to take your s- privilege to drive for six months, either which way. So you need to evaluate whether or not you think you're impaired to any degree. And if you've got any worry at all, even a mild one, that you could be over, and no one knows what an 08 is. I mean, online you can see your height and your weight and how many drinks you might have over a period of time. They'll give you a guesstimate, but, but no one really knows that. So if you're concerned, however, however slight it might be, don't take the test because a test over an 08 a is going to result in an administrative suspension of your privilege to drive, but B, be really compelling scientific evidence to establish your guilt. In a DUI first offense is not a trial that occurs before a jury of 12 that you have to be unanimous. Rather, in New Hampshire, a first offense is tried in our local district courts in front of a judge alone who's acting both as a decider of guilt or innocence as well as the person to sentence the defendant if they're convicted. And man, it's easy for that judge who's heard gobs of these DUI cases to hang his or her hat on a breath of blood result that exceeds an 08 as a piece of evidence. Yeah, I can imagine. So if you're concerned at all, the long-term integrity or defensibility of your case is going to be so much, much better if you keep from police and prosecutors that powerful piece of evidence, Mm. that piece of scientific evidence. So if you've had something to drink, you're concerned you might be impaired by it. You shouldn't do the test because our ability to defend that case is truthfully much better without having the test. Now, at the same time, If you're not impaired and you know it, you've had a single thing to drink, you're a larger person, whatever, taking the test is the only way out of that administrative license suspension. Because as I mentioned before, if you refuse to do it, they're going to ding your license with an administrative suspension of six months, just in the same way as if you blew over or take a blood test and it's over in 08, that will likewise result in a six-month suspension of your privilege to drive. There's so much more I can say about Mm. DUI defense. I defend them with a great team in Concord, Lauren Breda and Joe Chinin and Brian Quirk and our staff, uh, Heather Colby and Kathy Reinstra, are an amazing team for defending all sorts of crimes in Concord, but also in our Dover office, um, Tim Harrington and Sarah Landris, a newer lawyer to us, wonderful people, wonderful lawyers to defend these cases. And together as a group, we defend DUI cases as well as a range of criminal offenses in all 10 New Hampshire counties from north to south. We also veer into southern Maine, York and Cumberland County, as well as northern Massachusetts, too. So when things come up, we we stand ready to help out if that's uh, and to answer some of these questions too. But in addition to defending criminal cases, I can't help as a as a New Hampshire native also to know that our community, yours and mine, has been a hot spot for alien activity through the ages. You are a genius at segues. Right? It was a quick pivot. <laughs> I mean, I think the real concern if you had an alien at the whale who's also impaired, oh. I, don't, I don't know that I could, who knows who's got jurisdiction over double. that one. We hit double the there. intergalactic courtroom. <laughs> I'd love to appear there. But, but it, it, so it seemed like you didn't know this much, but New Hampshire's been a hot spot for alien activity. I did not know that. That shocks well, me because, really? I mean, Will, you strike me as a real Renaissance man. Oh, thank you. A jack of that. all trades. Well, thank you. Interested and in everything. And a giver everything. of candy. A giver of candy, which I'm so great. This is a bounty, man. I know. It's like being at the movies. Well, so I, the I can't, I don't know, I'm, I can't tell you I've got a particular interest. And as we get into the details of these stories, I, again, I'm certain your listeners might call into They're on the edge them. of their seats right now. But there are two of the most credible uh, UFO encounters have occurred in the state of New Hampshire. Um, the Benny and Barney Hill incident, you've heard of that one, I'm sure. No. So Betty and Barney Hill were a couple, I think this was in the 50s, and I could stand corrected on any of these details, so I'm going by memory, who were from Portsmouth and decided in their day to take a holiday to Montreal, if I recall, and they were driving back through and just south of Franconia Notch, where they each separately reported that they lost time to an alien encounter. And what was viewed at the time as credible about their ordeal was that they were separately hypnotized and told 
separately, under hypnosis, identical or nearly identical corroborating accounts of their ordeal and abduction at the hand of aliens. And it was also viewed as credible because while we talk about this story now to your throngs of adoring <laughs> listeners, I love you. these guys, Betty and Barney Hill, never sought to profit in their lives over this story as so many would these days. And so How they well kept do you it to themselves. How well? Reasonably well. Right, let me ask you a question. A, did they own a still? <laughs> there was no allegations they were impaired at the time of their abduction. Okay. And how did they, this block of time that was presumed gone, what, did they just wake up in a field? Uh, like they just black out and then- I think they woke up on the roadside, yeah. What? I think. And, I mean, the other thing that makes this credible is people beyond you and me, the powers that be, have identified this as credible. The state of New Hampshire issued one of those green roadside historic markers near exit 33 on 93, I believe. Um, to memorialize yeah. their account. They don't hand those out like candy, Ray. What? You hand out candy. Yeah. <laughs> but the good people who decide who's deserving of a historic marker in this great state, I'm they just don't hand out. I'm losing confidence in our government. Well, How is this? In separate from Betty and Barney Hill, yeah. um, there's the Exeter incident. Okay. And there's, I think, a yearly festival to commemorate the Exeter of incident, which be. actually didn't happen in Exeter, I don't think. I think it happened in Kensington, huh. where a local farmer in the 50s reported a UFO coming down over his field. Did and, he have a still? Well, I don't think so, but okay. he called police, Something and that officer here. also was sober as a judge, as they say. What? Who responded, and I think it has an eyewitness account, a police officer, and gener generated a police report. And the legend I've heard, again, I say legend because I'm not certain on all these details, but that they called local police. Local police alerted the Air Force, who at the time had a, a, a base at Pease Air Force Base on our, on our coast. They sent a dignitary out in order to try to evaluate what was going on. The airman that showed up allegedly tried to tell the police officer, don't create a police report over this. But the officer did so anyway. It was already done in that event, and the officer's eyewitness observations are memorialized for all time in an actual police report, which is also said to give that event, just like Benny and Barney's separately told identical stories under hypnosis, a lot of traction and credibility. And so those are the stories I'm aware of, but there's been recent stuff in the Concord area. Oh, but, but okay, hang on, hang on. Aside from maybe any probing that may have taken place, which I don't want to hear about, is there any physical evidence? I mean, the police officer shows up, but aside from this witness, is there like a burnt mark on the ground? Is there like... I don't know that. There, there's, circles, I, mean. I mean, in 2017 or 2018, the New York Times did a deep dive after the disclosure of a lot of previously secret information, which include videos from our airmen and women flying, I've you know, fancy those. jets. And yeah. they're, they're really compelling because they're clearly depicting objects flying against the wind and jet stream darting and maneuvering in a way that even our man-made craft can't. Those, are Those videos are from the government and are pretty compelling. I was listening to a podcast recently with a woman, I'm forgetting her name, who described, I think, that she was brought as a scientist by government actors to a, quote, crash site, I believe, in the desert of Arizona. It was separate from the Roswell site. And they collected pieces of, of 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 fabricated metal they described it but the fabricated metal felt and looked more like frog skin and they could crumple it up and it would immediately pop back but it also had been clearly fabricated by an intelligent species i think they invented that in wakanda <laughs> maybe they did i could use some of this stuff <laughs> But in those ways, too, I think that this there is are credible sci This scientist is credible. Uh, the, I mean, as, as far yeah, as no, I'm, I'm aware. I, I mean, I, I think I heard it on like Joe Rogan, so I don't know if you'd consider it credible. But um, I think that the government is engaged in collecting information about this, and that's not something I'm saying to you. We've heard recent um, congressional hearings over this topic where current and former governor act, government actors testified to this stuff. But there's stuff that's happened in New Hampshire, and I'm not making this stuff either. If you look in the Concord Patch, there was a recent event over the Smoke Shack Barbecue Restaurant in Bosquin where there was a UFO sighting. At the same time, there was one over the Steeplegate Mall in Concord. What? Yeah. What? Yeah, right here okay. in the capital. We've Seriously? had recent visits, my friend. Wait, okay. Ah, he's going to have to come back. Let go my ego. 
you have been listening to NH Unscripted. Again, you happy listener. I am your not-yet-to-be-probed host, Ray Dudley. We are coming to you from the studios of WKXL in Concord. 1450 AM, 103.9 FM, 101.9 FM in Manchester. NHTalkRadio.com is our URL. Jim Rosenberg has made his second appearance. <sighs> Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much for having hey, you me. you got a quick URL delight. for Shaheen? Yeah, www.shaheengordon, one word, dot com. We got You'll it all in. our firm there. We got it all in. See ya. Thank you.